Hi, Saxophone Geeks. Andy here, the Saxophone Geek. My name is Andy Volker. If you're new to the channel, welcome. Uh, today we're talking about some soprano sax. Um, I've played soprano for a long, long time, but not a lot. Uh, one of the first saxophones I got, other than alto, I started as an alto player. Um, and then uh, when I was in college, my grandpa bought me this horn. This is uh, Pop Pop, who was on the Volker side, my father's father. We had been, uh, we're at Berkeley. I was at Berkeley, it was like a family weekend, and they were up, and we were at some brunch in, and Bill Vint, who's a great saxophone player up here, was playing tenor and soprano in some trio, and uh, I was just telling Pop Pop, uh, you know, I was explaining to Mima about the soprano, and it was just a smaller saxophone, and whatever, and my Pop Pop took me aside, and he's like, hey, I'd like to help you get a soprano, why don't you go take a look, and I went and went to Rayburn's and talked to Emilio, and I looked at all the different price ranges, and I never thought he would go for the Selmer, this is the... Uh, this is a Selmer Series 2. I bought it in 1995, basically. Six, five or six. It's this one-piece Soprano uh, Series 2. And I've had it all those years. Um, it's had its damages. You know, Pop-Up, I wasn't sure he would go for the expensive one. So I, I played the Winstons, and I played the Yamaha, and I played this and that. And I called him up, and I told him what I said. He's like, well, why don't you go with the Selmer? So this was it. And uh, I've had it for years. It's been damaged a few times. It's taken some falls. I uh, had it overhauled um, two years ago by Jack Finucian at Boston Sax Shop, and then it took another fall, and he had to straighten it back out, and it's pretty good, and then, you know, I just haven't been feeling it, and I finally uh, had it uh, worked on. There's a new tech at the Boston Sax Shop, Frank Cazero, who's in really good, he's great, and he's a good dude, and I brought it to him, and he kind of set it back up. It had some things that it needed, and... Um, starting to play pretty good. I'm inspired to play it more because, uh, mainly because George Garzon uh, and The Fringe, George has been playing his soprano more, and that guy sounds so good on that thing, it's hard to not want to pick one up and play it yourself. So, one of the things that happened is I ordered, and I won an eBay auction for a mouthpiece, and we're going to talk about that. So I'm going to put the horn down. Uh, I apologize for the sound quality on the audio, I'm just using the iPhone here because I'm lazy and I didn't feel like setting up all the gear. Um, so that's what we're gonna do. We're gonna take a look at the Soprano Mac mouthpieces that I own. I think this is all of them. And then what we picked up, and we'll talk a little bit about them. Uh, keep in mind, this is all my perspective and for how I play and everybody plays different. Um, and it's important to remember that, you know, what's gonna work for me isn't gonna work for you. Um, and even though we all sort of know that, it still is worth repeating. And I hope my head is in the picture. Haha, <laughs> if it isn't, I'll reshoot all this. A little uh, tidbit for you. So let me move the camera and we'll take a look at some mouthpieces and our new project. All right, I will turn the camera down on the table so you can see what we've got here. Um, the mouthpiece you just heard, we will look at that. That's a soloist. These aren't really soloists. So Selmer made soloists for tenor and alto and baritone. But the soloist model didn't really go to the soprano. The soprano ended up with a round small chamber, and we'll take a pretty closer look at that. Um, I have two of them. I have one that was an a original F, E, let's look at it. This is the first main soprano piece I ever had. I played on this for a long, long time. It's an original condition, unrefaced, F on the table, which this is pretty uncommon. The way it works with the old Selmer pieces is that if the letter is on the table for the size in an oval, uh, that is pretty old. If it's not in an oval, if it's some of them said like table C, table B, those are really, really early. Um, when it's on the table, those are from the 50s and 60s. And then if the letter is on the body on the outside of the mouthpiece here, that's a later mouthpiece from the 70s, early 80s. Um, and they look a little bit, there's other differences as well. One of the main differences is the shape of the chamber on the inside, especially for these rubber pieces. I know more about the rubber ones than the metal ones, and that's why we're doing this video. Um, so the largeness of the chamber inside here, right about here in the mouthpiece, is a little different on the older Selmer piece, so Soprano pieces. The later ones have a little less internal space there, and hence play a little differently. Um, we will get back to this mouthpiece. Um, so that's what I have here. I have a couple of um, 
these Super Sessions mouthpieces, which is a mouthpiece that Selmer made in the 90s and 2000s. I think they still make them. I have one square chamber E that I actually worked a little bit on myself on the baffle and the tip rail. We'll talk about that. This is a Barry mouthpiece, but it's a company. It's not a baritone sax mouthpiece. These are pretty good. These also have a round chamber. I'll show you more about that. Uh, this is an interesting one. Again, there's two of these Super Sessions. I have a slant link that I inherited. I couldn't afford to buy one nowadays. Uh, these are very, very expensive. I had it refaced. It plays okay. Um, but this is a proper slant soprano with the giant chamber. We'll take a closer look at that. Um, uh, expertly refaced, but still not my kind of thing. Uh, but uh, long story on that one, but I inherited it. I didn't even know I had it. It was out of mind. I did, had no idea it even existed. Uh, and then my mom found a bunch of stuff in the house down in Jersey. Um, she said, hey, I found a piece. I was like, what are you talking about? Actually, it was both. It was actually this, the little E, um, the S80 style square chamber E, and this slant, which had never really been played. Um, uh, it plays better having been refaced, but still not my favorite mouthpiece. And then I have two of these Autolink standard small chamber. This isn't the square chamber Steve Lacey model. This is the later, what you'd call current production Autolink uh, soprano pieces. And I have a 7 and a 5. I think I played this one a decent amount, the 7. Uh, I haven't played it in years. Uh, hold on, let me flip the camera. All right, I don't know if this messes up the video or not. Um, just thought, I just picked up this album yesterday. Again, more soprano in the mind. And I just happened past a record store. Uh, and I picked up this Steve Lacey record. Uh, if you don't know it, check it out. It is um, Soprano Sax Prestige. I haven't heard it yet. Went and Kelly on it, so it should be pretty happening. We're gonna check it out, I haven't checked it out yet. Um, but I thought it'd be interesting to put that here because we're talking about the soprano sax and that was his main axe. Lacey didn't play anything other than soprano. I'm sure he could, he just didn't, right? Um, so, among the oldest soprano mouthpieces that I have um, that I played on the most were these two. This Barry, B-A-R-I, that's the company, not the type of saxophone. And it is a small round chamber. I hope you could see that. I was trying to make this more clear for you. But this is a small round chamber, a lot like the Selmer pieces. Um, these are pretty good mouthpieces. I mean, uh, I played it for a while. Um, this is a 770, which is tip opening, which is a little over a 7. This is a pretty big mouthpiece for a soprano, I think. Uh, these all have, this isn't added, this is their design. These all have a metal shank ring around it, but it's rubber all the way into into the shank there. And these are pretty good mouthpieces. If you can find one cheap, they're probably pretty cheap. Um, these are good pieces, good material. Doesn't smell outwardly like rubber, but this is old. This is an old, I've had this 25 years. I mean, this is an old mouthpiece. So um, probably still using hard rubber at that time. Cool, good on you, mate. Nice, next one is, let's see, what's the next oldest? Is this one, really? I mean, uh, this, is, this was my primary Selmer uh, round chamber. We call them soloists because this was made when the solos were made, but this doesn't have the scrolly marking on it. It's got the regular Selmer logo. It doesn't say soloist on it. It does have the F in the chain in, on, in the oval. It means it's an older mouthpiece. And one of the things about these earlier ones that I like is they have a much uh, more uh, deeper chamber. There's a little more dug out material in here, the way this is cast. And uh, so these have a little bit of a warmer sound, a little more round than the later ones. How do you tell a later one? Well, the later ones have more of a sharp angle on the beak and the num letter for the chamber, for the tip size is on the back of the mouthpiece here. So that's one of the main ways you can tell the difference between the old soloists or whatever the, you'd call this, whatever this scroll soprano mouthpiece is. Uh, and this is an original F that was never refaced. You can tell that, I don't know if you could see, but there's fairly thick tip rail the way they made them. Uh, and this was a great mouthpiece. I eventually needed something a little more open, uh, but that's a great piece. I played that a long time. Uh, here's another something kind of interesting. This is 
A bunch of old gear. I don't really use a lot of it. This is an early mouthpiece cap. These are pretty neat. This came off of something else. And then a very uncommon Harrison ligature. Uh, this is a really uncommon. This is a real Harrison ligature for Soprano. I got it really, really cheap at Rayburn's back in the day. Uh, and even then, the, cell, the alto and tenor Harrison ligatures were becoming expensive. I believe it's even gold-plated. Uh, but it only fits this one mouth. It's a really weird ligature. It doesn't fit on a lot of mouthpieces, so I don't use it. Um, this is very interesting. This is a Wolf Tane Soprano mouthpiece. Now this is a round chamber, much, much, much like the old soloists. Um, and it's got, I mean, a pretty nice uh, chamber here. I have a hard time showing you. If I had a monitor, it'd be easier to show you this. Um, but it says Wolf Tane on it. And he was, who was Wolf Tane? Wolf Tane was a mouthpiece maker. I think he worked for a number of the big companies. And then in the 70s made his own mouthpieces. And this is one of them. The interesting thing about this one, it has been cut short. If you can see here, someone bandsawed the back of this mouthpiece off. And it's a pretty small opening. It's, it's a five. And it doesn't play that great. But I remember when I did play it, I loved the sound of this mouthpiece. So I think this would be a mouthpiece someday to have, uh, you know, refaced and see what comes of it. Because I remember liking this a lot when I did play it, the sound of it. Um, so that's the next oldest. Um, and then I've had these for a while. These are stock Autolink round chamber uh, mouthpieces, as you can see. Um, pretty nice mouthpieces for what they are. They're just, these are stockers. There's nothing modern about, you know, different about these, interesting about these. Seven star, five. Um, you know, they're interesting. I, I, don't, I never use them that much, but obviously I must have played the seven a good amount. But they're pretty much, I don't know, they're sort of identical. I have a feeling this one, the seven star, is a little older, but it doesn't matter. The current production. So then the next one, let's look at the Super Sessions. Now the Super Sessions are kind of like the old scroll shank. Um, and uh, these are pretty good. What's great about these is you can get them in very open sizes because these are modern and Selmer was starting to get hip to players wanting larger mouthpieces. The only problem I see is that the letter came off of this. This was a J and the other one is an H. H-I-J. So this is the more open one. This is the one I played. I played this for a lot, a lot for a while. Good mouthpieces. Pretty small chamber. A little smaller than the original soloists were, I think. Yeah, that's pretty, that's pretty small. Uh, but these play really good. These are good mouthpieces. I mean, uh, uh, let's see what kind of ligature we got on here. Another old, this is the Joe Henderson look in the style ligature but we're missing a screw on it. It might be through stripped out too. I'm not sure why I don't really use that. Um, so there's another Soul Super Sessions. They're good for the money. Those are really good soprano mouthpieces. This is the, these are the ones that came from the Polish man. So I grew up in New Jersey and my good friend who I went to high school with, we're still friends, he and his wife and their kids, they're good friends of mine, Andy Sikowitz. He's 100% Polish and they have a big Polish family and all the families in music. And they had a friend, Bollock, who lived near us, and he was a saxophone player and played a lot of gigs with Andy's dad in the, in the day. And he would fix saxophones and stuff, and he had this old archaic King Soprano. And that's how I ended up with these mouthpieces. This is a older S80E, and I modified this a little bit. It had a really thick tip rail, so I filed a little bit and modified the tip rail, and you get a little more, little more baffle out of it. This is very interesting. I wouldn't do it again, or Maybe I would. I do like to mess around with that stuff. Um, anyway, and also got this from him. Now, this is a slant, what we call a slant. It's an Autolink Soprano mouthpiece. It does say USA on it, but it is a true slant. It's got a huge chamber. So this is the largest. This is so different than everything else I own. Going with those. And had this refaced by Peter Scott, uh, as well as the main soloist that you heard. Let's take a look at that one. So this is the soloist that I got. Again, I think it was an eBay purchase. Um, got a decent deal on it. And then had it refaced. And I play this a lot. This is more open. It's got the table marking, the uh, C star on the table. And then I had it opened up. 
And it's again, it's a little bit of a larger chamber in here, down in there, uh, as the early castings were. And it was a very, very nice mouthpiece. I still play it to this day. So these two are the real primaries. Uh, and we have our original soloist right there, which I don't play very much. Um, all the other ones just stay in, in the toolbox. I don't really use them. Um, a bunch of ligatures that go with them. It's going to take me a minute to get it all back in the case. Um, but let us now move on to the next mouthpiece project, and it is soprano related. All right, now the final order of business is to take a look at the... Um, the new hotness. And if you follow my channel, you know I like vintage mouthpieces and I enjoy um, trying different mouthpieces and it kind of keeps me focused. I'm a little ADD personally. So trying mouthpieces, uh, experimenting, uh, having mouthpieces refaced, it keeps me practicing, it keeps me on, on, on business and as opposed to watching The Mandalorian season two over and over again. Okay. So I bid it on a soprano mouthpiece. I really have not changed soprano mouthpieces in years. We see what you see here, I've been building over the years. My current soloist and this one that I had refaced, these two, um, I've been, this is this, we, Peter Scott refaced those for me and it was a long, long time ago. Um, so uh, at least seven years or so. Uh, again, I don't play the soprano much, so I don't invest in gear, but I bid on a soprano mouthpiece. I've been recently working with uh, Adam Nywood on some refacing. He's an old friend of mine, great saxophone man, knows his stuff. We speak the same language, uh, and I've known him for years and years and years. And so he did uh, some stuff over the summer for me, if you remember, um, the link that I had him touch up, and the alto link, the uh, rubber link that's pretty cool. Uh, and that was another sort of experiment because I've never had an alto slant. Uh, I didn't know if I would even like it. It turned out really nice. Um, and uh, part of that's Adam's facing work and expertise in that, in that department. Um, he really knows how to set an alto mouthpiece up. Um, that one's pretty neat. Who knows if we'll even like this? We're going to go ahead and unbox it. I'm going to do my best not to expose you to my address. Um, but we're going to go ahead and try and open this up and take a look at what we have. Again, I, I, uh, I bidded low. I really try not to spend a lot of money. I've been looking for a mouthpiece like this for a while, and I got this way cheaper than I thought, cheaper than the other ones were, and it even has the box. Let's take a look and see what we got. So we have a vintage Selmer in its box and everything, soprano mouthpiece. Let's take this out of here. Um, pictures were pretty good. There's a lot of red stuff all over this box. This box kind of fell apart in shipping. <laughs> um, that's kind of gross. But let's take it out of here and see what we got. Now, this doesn't necessarily mean that this is a very old mouthpiece. This could have been made, probably made in the 80s. We'll find out. But it's got its little funny cap that these came with which I was never a huge fan of, but this is the reed protector. It's not really a mouthpiece cap. Um, and here it is. We have a little tiny jewel-like Sea Star Soprano mouthpiece with the ligature, which is super cool. Um, Selmer made in Paris. They threw a reed on there. It's an old, wow, it's an old Rico reed. Look at that. Trash, obviously. And here's our mouthpiece, and boy, don't it look nice. We got the red crap all over it from the box. But uh, this is a, uh, a real sea star. Now, as I was talking about with the Sol Selmer Soprano mouthpieces, we know this is a lot later because it has the letter C star on the top of the mouthpiece as opposed to on the table. Uh, but nonetheless, that's cool. This is a round chamber mouthpiece. Let me see if I can show you that like the other ones. Um, and it looks pretty darn good, man. There's zero teeth marks on the bite plate. So wow, this is really something. Uh, this is pretty cool. The box is garbage. It literally disintegrated. Um, that's a bummer, but we're not that, I don't care. Uh, let's, I'm gonna clean this up and get the gunk, the uh, red stuff off of it. Hold on. All right, here she is. I'll try to keep my hand out of the shadow. Like a piece of jewelry, really neat. Uh, really good condition considering. Um, got all that red stuff out of there, which is good. 
And uh, I should have been standing and doing this the whole time because I can see much better in the camera. Uh, as you can see, it's got a round chamber and it's a little bit bigger. I don't know, I would say compared to the stock, how can I show you? Soloist, that that chamber is a little bigger. The round chamber of the metal one is a little tiny bit bigger. I don't know. Certainly way bigger than the little Super Session. Um, but you know, this is this mouthpiece is going to have its own, very much its own quality anyway. This could be fairly modern production. I don't know. That reed that was on there, stuck on there, was pretty darn old. So it's hard to say. I don't know. What do you think? When do you think this mouthpiece was made? There's no barcode on it. That's the one thing. There's no sticker with a barcode on any of the packaging, which is the first thing it tells you. Um, so C star, soprano sax, B flat. I don't know. This, this box is pretty gross. I might never put that mouthpiece back in that box. It's neat to have, but it's really disintegrating. So I don't know. That's kind of gross. Pretty neat though. Look, uh, when was the last time you saw one of those? So um, maybe we'll throw the reed on there and see what it sounds like, but this is not, you know, this needs to be refaced. So let's, uh, I'll reposition the camera and we'll, we'll, we'll blow through it. That red stuff was all over the ligature too. I had to, uh, had to clean that. Let's see if this will, if this ligature holds the reed nicely. Let's find out. It should. I mean, I really don't think this was played very much at all, if, if anything, um, really. Wow, look how close that is. Look at that tip opening. Wow, I'm not gonna be able to play this at all, but let's give it a try nonetheless. And that's a hard read, that's a four soft um, jazz select. So, I mean, that's, that's not a soft read, but it's not gonna, this is gonna be difficult to play. tone and that's what we're looking for. You can hear the sound. Um You know, cool but unplayable as a C star. That's that's a that's laughable right there. But man, what a neat mouthpiece. So, this is pretty cool and I'm very excited to have Adam um, throw a job on this when he gets to it. I'm going to send it to him immediately, uh, and then he'll get to it when he can. He's got a long list. He's a, you know, in-demand refacer, as you will. Uh, anyway, so this is pretty darn neat. I, uh, would wait for years to find one of these, and there it is. So, uh, we'll have it refaced, bring it up to a playable adult modern facing, and go from there. So, C-Star, metal soloist for the soprano, or just, not soloist, but scroll shank for the soprano. So thanks for watching this video. I hope you liked it. Let me know what kind of soprano mouthpiece you're playing, what kind of reads you like on the soprano. Do you play soprano? Do you hate it? Is it the worst thing ever? Um, and that's that. So thanks a lot for watching. Saxophone Geek, I don't know if you can even see me. Let's do this. So thanks for watching Saxophone Geek. I'm Andy Volker, the Saxophone Geek out of the Boston area. Uh, let me know your thoughts on this video. Do you play soprano? What kind of piece do you have? What do you like? Um, and that's that. So thanks a lot for watching Saxophone Geek and more about this when it comes in uh, ready to play. And thanks. Cheers. Saxophone Geek.